Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue in. As you came in today, you got a bulletin, you got an outline there you can follow along with today. If you're joining us uh, using your iPhones and apps or you at home, you can use version. We've got the outline there for you with all of the points and the scriptures there. As you can see today, we're going to talk about some truths about pride. Now, pride is one of those topics that uh, the Bible has a lot to say about. Now, how many of you know that it's, it's okay to be proud of something? Is that true? Okay. It's okay to be proud of something. It's okay to be proud of someone, but there's a difference between being proud and being prideful, as we'll find out in just a moment. This year, as we started off, we said that we wanted to focus on leaning into God, drawing closer to Him. So we took some time, or we're taking some time, to talk about some of those things that the enemy uses, uh, that the world will use to try to distract us from that closeness with, with God. And so last week we talked about self. We talked about selfishness. And we talked about the way that uh, we are wired. As human beings, we are wired to want to look out for number one. You know, numero uno, right? But it comes through surrender. And, and you'll find that the, there's going to be a key of surrender in almost everything that we do. Because when we're talking about pride... Um, I got a number of scriptures uh, what we'll go through and read today, but pride is one of those things that we've got to watch out for because it's very sneaky. It just rises up within you sometimes and you don't even realize that it's there. Have you ever been prideful? Can, can you remember back any time when you were so sure of something or so full of maybe yourself and only it came to ruin? You know, there's, there's times when that happens in life. And so I want to take some time, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to just put the text as Exodus 4. I want to talk to you about the story, because there's so many great stories in the Bible. But one of them I think that's great is when, when God calls Moses to lead the children, uh, uh, you know, and he goes to Pharaoh, remember this? And then all of the plagues that come. Well, we see a story there of Pharaoh and the pride that takes place, but we also see the opposite side to that, where you have somebody like Moses who doesn't feel qualified. Has, have you ever had God tell you to do something and you didn't feel qualified to do it? You didn't feel like you had what it takes? You didn't feel like you were smart enough? You didn't feel like you had the strength to do it? And, but at the end of the day, what really matters is that if God told you to do it, what is he expecting you to do? Do it. Yeah, to just simply obey. And then on the other side, you've got somebody like Pharaoh who thinks he has it all together. He has all of the answers. He's in control. He's in power. And he has all of the authority, but yet he doesn't understand uh, what it means to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so he's full of pride. And, and before we get too hard on Pharaoh or anybody else that deals with pride, there's times when you and I, I'm sure, have had these moments where we've become prideful. Um, it's been a number of years ago. One, I, I think one of the lessons I learned the most was at a job I worked at called RJS Electronics. Um, I don't think it's in town anymore, but it was an electronics store where they installed uh, security cameras, they did phone systems, they did... Uh, burglar alarms, and so I learned on that job to do some of those things, and I, I was getting pretty good at it, and I was feeling pretty good about the job, and I, I thought I knew my stuff. You know, one of the phrases that young people say to parents a lot, or at least I did to mine, was the phrase, I know, you know what I mean? You know, they'll tell you to do something, don't forget to do that, I know, you know, don't forget that you got, I know, and, and it's, you don't necessarily mean it as a prideful comment, but you're saying, I know, I, I've got this figured out. And when I was at this job, um, I was going down to what would have then been Jetters Hauling. It's not down there any longer. We had a job to do. And I was tasked with kind of heading up how that job was going to be done. So my boss and my coworker both sat down with me and said, you got everything you need? And I said, yeah, I got it. I got it. It's under control. I know what I'm doing. And um, they'd come back later. I, Did you remember to get? And they would list something. I know. I got it. I got it. But, and they say, you sure you know the steps you need? I, I've got this. I know what to do. And I went down for that job. And what we were tasked to do was to put up some surveillance cameras. So that meant you had to drill a hole in the wall, had to put a mount up there, run some wire, hook up the cameras, you know. I, I got this. I know what I'm doing. This is no problem. 
Anybody can do this. And when you get comfortable thinking about how good you are, have you learned that that's usually when you mess up the most? At least it was true for me. And um, I, I don't think I recognized it necessarily as pride at the time, but I, I've got this. I'm doing good in my field. I'm doing good in this job. And so I went ahead and I got the ladder out and I started to get ready to mount, to drill some holes. But what I did not know is that behind the sheetrock that I was drilling against, there was a, a sheet of metal behind it. And so when you drill and you keep on drilling and trying to force it and make it happen, all you do is heat up that sheet metal, right? And all of a sudden, it got so hot, I couldn't get through there. And my, my coworker came by, he says, everything okay? And I said, yeah, I got this, right? And I was starting to get nervous now because I'm like, why am I having such a hard time? And all of a sudden, I, I had a quarter inch drill bit, you know, just a small hole, right? Going through there. And I pulled the drill out. And when I pulled the drill out, a little tiny puff of smoke came out of that hole. And I thought, huh, that's odd. You know, that's, I don't think that's supposed to happen, is it? You know, never had that before. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll just blow in there <laughs> and that'll take care of it. When I did that, a little more smoke came out. And I thought, this is really odd. Maybe I'll just drill a little bit more. And so I tried working away. I thought if I could make the hole a little bigger, I can see what's going on. Unbeknownst to me, what had happened was that it got so hot that a piece of the sheetrock started to kind of catch on fire, smolder a little bit. And that piece fell down to the ground behind inside the wall. That piece of the wall started to fill up with smoke. How many of you know when you've just told your boss and your coworker that you got this and you know what you're doing, everything is under control, and then smoke starts to appear out of the wall, you're starting to get a little nervous. That would have been a good time for me to tell them I needed help. But I didn't. You know why? Because I didn't want anybody to know that I, I didn't know what I was doing or that I was stuck or I, something wrong was going on. And so I tried to address it a little bit better. Finally, I called my coworker. I said, I don't know what's going on, man. And he goes, well, that's not good. So here was his answer. He got a glass full of water, put his mouth on the wall, and spit water into the hole. <laughs> that did not help. It didn't do much. Smoke kept coming out. So you know what we had to do? We had to go find uh, Mr. Jetter at the time and said, Mr. Jetter, and if you ever knew Mr. Jetter, I was nervous talking to Mr. Jetter. And I said, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but I said, there's some smoke coming out of the wall and we're not sure why. And he says, well, we're going to have to get the fire department down here to check it out because where there's smoke, there's what? Fire. So now I'm embarrassed. I'm thoroughly just feeling embarrassed. I mean, I thought I knew it all. I thought I had it figured out. And so I had to call the fire department. And here's what I told them. I said, hey, we're down here. This is what I was doing. There's some smoke coming out of the wall. It's not a big deal. Can you just send down one of your trucks, you know, like maybe the, the pickup truck or the S10 or, you know, just have one of the firemen look at it and see if it's a problem. But how many of you know that when you call a fire department and say smoke is coming out of a wall, they're not just going to casually show up. Before I knew it, 10 minutes later, I'm standing with my friend. We're waiting for somebody to show up and we hear off in the distance those air horns on the fire truck, you know, uh, uh, woo, and here they come. And I went, oh no, they're bringing the whole brigade. And here they came. There was three trucks that showed up, cops shut down the road, and firemen came out in their coats and in their air tanks and their mask and their hat, and they walked up to me and they said, where's the fire? And I had to point to a quarter inch hole in the wall. And I said, right there, and they said, that's it? And I said, yeah, but here's the thing. They had to tear that wall open, and when they tore the wall open, there was still stuff that was smoldering had it not been addressed there probably would have been a fire. How many of you know I was completely embarrassed in that moment? I thought to myself, I had it all figured out. I thought, I've got this job nailed. I know exactly what to do. But the reality was, is I had more faith in me than I did anybody else, and that was my downfall. I thought I had all the answers, and I, I had it all figured out. Well, there's a lot of people in the Bible that did the same thing, and, and and by the way, I'm sure we've all been there at some point in time in our life when we thought we had it all figured out, only to find out we didn't know as much as we thought we knew. And there's lessons that we can learn in the midst of that. Because when pride creeps in, and what pride is, is anytime we exalt ourselves above God, when we think we know better, 
And what it does is it edges God out. And here all of a sudden in the Bible, there's a man named Moses that, that God speaks to him and says, I want you to go and I want you to, to free my people. And go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him that God wants his people to come and worship. Let my people go. But as we all know the story, that uh, Moses was struggling. He was too scared to do it. He was afraid. He didn't feel like he had what it took. And so he started to cry out to God and said, God, I, I don't know if I can do this. If you can just give me, give me some help. And here's what it says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in t- uh, time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. In other words, choose somebody else. Has God ever spoke to you and told you to do something, and you said, oh, anybody but me, God? Just, Just choose somebody else. And he was struggling and, and down a few verses, it says that the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Now, why was he angry at him? He was angry because he knew that I told you to do this, I want you to do it. You have what it takes. But it says that the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, is that not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, There's times when God will speak to us and he'll tell us what we need to do. He'll tell us the next step. Or maybe sometimes we're just, we we hear the Lord and our thought is, oh God, anybody else but me. You know, can't, can't you find another way? But what God is simply looking for in those moments is not a conversation. He's simply looking for obedience. And have you ever tried to help God out when God tells you to do something and you say, have you thought of this? Or why don't you try that? A lot of times it's because we're trying to come up with an alternative plan, but that's not what God's looking for. What God wants more than anything else is just simply our obedience. So it says that Moses and Aaron, they went to Pharaoh. And in Exodus 5, it says, the, Lord, uh, the God of Israel, he said, let my people go that we may, may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let them go to Israel? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh was a man that was full of pride. He said, I don't know who God is. I don't care who God is. I have all authority. I have all the power. And Pharaoh hears Moses and just discredits everything that that God is saying. Why? Because he says, I've never heard of the Lord. There's pride that's there. And This is a perfect picture of what takes place. Now, I'm going to just sum it up. I don't want to take, we could spend all day talking about all the different plagues that go on and what what takes place. But what happens is, is this is where the battle begins between Moses and Pharaoh. The multiple plagues that start to take place. And all of these are brought on because Pharaoh clings to pride rather than humility. In your life and in my life, anytime we cling to pride, it brings on something that was never designed to be in our life because God is always looking for us to humble our hearts. Exodus chapter 7 says, um, verse 12 says, for each one threw down his staff and they turned into serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up all the other staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them. Uh, Moses is is back and he's saying again, let my people go. But we see Pharaoh's heart every time was hardened and he wouldn't listen at all. Goes on to say, Moses said to Pharaoh, uh, the honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs might be destroyed? Do you remember the plague of the frogs? They were talking about how there were frogs everywhere. How many of you would love to have frogs everywhere in your house, in your bed, in the stove, you know, everywhere? Nobody would want that. Nobody would like that. And this is the plague that took place. And and it was interesting to me because Pharaoh was finally getting sick of all of this. There was a a battle that was going on of who was going to be the Lord. Pharaoh thought he was, but Moses was there saying, no, it's it's the Lord our God. 
And so this plague of the frogs was there, and finally Pharaoh had enough, and he said, please, just get rid of the frogs. I'm done with them. And something very interesting happens. Moses said to Pharaoh, when would you like me to get rid of the frogs? Do you remember the answer? Tomorrow. And I thought that was kind of odd. If it were me, I'd be like, how about right now? Or how about yesterday? Or, you know, I just, I I don't want them around there. Uh, It was kind of a strange response. I mean, if Pharaoh is so sick of the frogs, and if he's asking for Moses to get rid of them, and and he's willing to give in and let them go and worship, don't you think he'd want to get rid of the frogs now? But no. Pharaoh, when asked, when would you like to get rid of the frogs? He says, tomorrow. Why would he say tomorrow? uh, But the question is, are we any different? In my mind, I think, I wonder if he said tomorrow because he thought, if I can have some time to try to come up with an answer for this, then I don't have to submit to the fact that he's, he's the Lord. If I, can, if I can figure it out in my own strength, if I, can, if I can figure it out my own way, then I can be my own God, and I can be the one that provides for me, and I don't need him. But yet he says tomorrow. Sometimes we struggle with things in life whether it's addiction or pain or worry or stress, whatever it is, and we ask God for help. But sometimes, do we tell him tomorrow? You know, Because we want to try to figure it out in our own strength. Because when we do that, that's where pride starts to creep in. And we have to be very careful of that because the enemy will use that to get into our, into our hearts and separate us from just humbling our heart in the presence of God. That's the goal, is that we come to a place where we Humble our hearts in the presence of God. So many people want to be important, though, don't they? I mean, when we think of pride, you know, there's many different things that we try to celebrate on a human level. We have pride groups. We have pride weeks. We have pride days. We have many other things that we try to take and twist that. But it's all an effort so that we can feel uh, important about ourselves or so we can feel like we're our own God. Um, and we've got to be very careful of that pride that creeps in. I heard a story of an army colonel who was just recently promoted, and he wanted to look really important in front of all of his, his people, so he uh, saw a private that was coming into the room, so he grabbed the phone real quick and pretended to be on the phone with the president and said, Mr. President, yes, sir, it's okay. And he told the private, hold on just a moment, yes, sir, Mr. President. Yes, sir, I, I, I will do that, Mr. President. Mr. President, can you hold on just one moment? He looked at the private and he said, what do you want? I'm on the phone. And the private said, I'm here to hook up your telephone. (laughs) Trying to pretend to be important, but yet it never works. How many times have we been in places in our life where we try to prop ourselves up? You see, God really wants us to learn what it means to humble our heart because pride will just come in and destroy. So here's what I want to do. In your outlines, it looks kind of lengthy, but I'm going to go through the first five really quick. Uh, What are some of the truths about pride that the Bible has to say? And then I'm going to just spend a little bit more time on how can we keep our pride in check? Because we're all going to face it. We're all going to face this reality. Um, And so the first truth is simply this. The more pride we see in others, the more angry we can get. Um, Pride is something that we will always have to deal with. It seems like the more we try to say we aren't prideful, the more we actually become prideful. And one of the truths about pride is that it's easier to see it in others than it is within ourselves. Isn't that true? I mean, it's easier for me to be able to observe it in someone else's life, but it's always harder to see it in my own. And that's the tricky thing about all of this. And and the Holy Spirit will speak to you, but you have to be willing to surrender. You have to be willing to receive what the Lord wants to say. You see, if somebody, if you were to come and tell me that I'm, I'm acting immature, let's say, I will get defensive. I will tend to want to do that. But when the Holy Spirit comes along, and he, st- he tells me I'm acting immature, I can receive that a little better. But, but it's because I'm, I'm willing, the Holy Spirit just has a way of revealing that in our hearts and our lives. But it's always easier to spot somebody else's weaknesses. Uh, the second truth is that pride leaves, leads to every other vice. W- w- what do you mean by that? Uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says this, When pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is what? Wisdom. With the humble is wisdom. Pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. See, when you lean into pride, 
God has nothing to do with that. When pride creeps in, its desire is always to lead you away from any direction that leads you back to God. And at the root of all of those vices is pride. Um, you can get full of yourself and think you've got it figured out, but have you found that the, way, the world has a way of humbling you? <laughs> uh, it, true story, former heavyweight, his name was Jimmy Tillis from Oklahoma, and he fought out of Chicago. So he still remembers his first day in the Windy City. It was in the 1980s. He said he got off the bus with two cardboard suitcases under his arms in downtown Chicago. He says he stopped in front of the Sears Tower, and he said, I put down the suitcases. I looked up at the Sears Tower, and he said these words, I am going to conquer Chicago. And when he looked down, his suitcases were gone. <laughs> Somebody stole them. He had all this pride and all this feeling of this is, I am going to, I'm here to win. But then all of a sudden, he got ripped off. When you get full of pride, you're, the, the enemy is just going to steal from you. So we must be very careful to watch out for that, tricky, uh, that trickiness of, of pride. Here's number three. Pride will get in the way of everything. Pride will get in the way. How many of you would feel comfortable having a 16-year-old be your king, <laughs> be your president of the United States, let's say. Well, I don't think any of us would be comfortable with that. But here's a, a man in the Bible, his name's King Uzziah. He was 16 years old, okay? And when he was 16, he became king. And it says that he was blessed by the Lord. He gave the Lord all the glory. He gave the Lord all the honor. And God took care of him. And he grew. Now, that's great. That's good. He, he blessed him. The Lord blessed him with land. It says that the Lord blessed him with riches. It says that God helped him develop an army and be victorious, and God was with him, and, it, and he grew. But, and you always hate it when there's a but in the Bible, right? Second Chronicles 26, when he became strong, King Uzziah, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. Here's a story, true story, of a young man blessed by God, gave him the glory and the honor, but then when he got all of the stuff that he wanted, he became proud, and that was the beginning of his downfall. You see, all of a sudden, pride got in, involved in that, and it destroyed everything that took place. It's the same for you and me if we're not careful. It, when pride gets in there, no matter how much you accumulate, no matter how much you have, Pride will bring destruction in your life. Not only will it do that, but here's number four. Pride will separate you and I from God. When we get full of that pride, when we embrace that, when we lean into it, no matter how smart you are, good you are, how, how much money you're able to make, when pride gets in there, not only is it something that gets in the way of everything, but it separates you and me from the presence of God. That's why, God's, that's why he's so against pride, because it separates us. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Uh, it's up on, the, up on the screen. Let's read that one together. You ready? Go. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. So he, he's very clear about how he feels about this. He says that I'm, I'm not about pride, because it brings a separation between him and his children. And when we partake in the things that displease God, it, it just brings more of that separation. The, the, the pride that says, I deserve this. Uh, the pride that, that says, I have earned this. Or, or pride can sound like this, I am entitled to this. That, that's when we start embracing pride. And we got to be very careful because when that happens, it starts to separate us from the blessings that God wants to bring in and through our lives. And, and then the other thing about pride, number five, is this. Pride causes our prayers to be hindered. Pride causes our prayers to be hindered. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall, meaning when pride gets in the way, although God may have the best for us, we will miss out. We will be blinded to the blessings of God because of the pride that creeps into our hearts and in our lives. Pride is very dangerous. And when I look at Pharaoh, he was a man who built his kingdom and 
was put upon a throne and, and, and given so much that he thought he owned it all. He thought he deserved it all. He had the entitlement. He, he had everything that went with that. And it only brought a destruction. You know, we celebrate in the, our world today, <clears throat> we celebrate a lot of things uh, about pride. I can't help but think as we're talking about pride and wonder why pride is such a persistent vice in our lives. I think maybe it's because we don't condemn it in our society as much as, as it could be or should be. We celebrate it. Take a look in the news and in, in, in the newspapers. There's um, politicians, popular athletes, the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. We love to, to prop them up, but we only have what we have because of the, the grace of God. Right? Amen? It, we have what we have because of him. And what he's looking for is people who will humble their hearts so that he may exalt them, as we'll find out in a moment. You know, the question remains, are we able to get rid of that pride? What do we, what do, we do when we're facing that? Because even in the Bible, uh, uh, very beginning, book of Genesis, uh, the story's found there, Cain and Abel. Um, remember when they gave their offering? when they gave their first offerings before the Lord. The Lord liked the, uh, liked the offering that was given by Abel. Cain was a little, he, a little displeased with that, and his pride was hurt, but the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Cain, and he said this, Be careful, Cain, because sin is crouching at the door, and it's looking to master you, but you must master it. In other words, watch out for pride. At, around the corner, this world and the enemy of our soul is going to try to trip us up, its desire is for us, but we have to be able to master it. Cain was not able to. He, he murdered his own brother, and he lost his future. So how do we keep pride in check? You know, how are we going to do that? And I, I'm just going to give you a few things right out of the Scripture. Here's number one. It starts with admission. We must be willing to admit that pride, when we embrace it, can have a control over us. It's when we admit it, when we bring it, admission, coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, this, I, I, I recognize I'm prideful in this area and I want to surrender that to you. It's a time when, even in my own life, when I was young, I, 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 you all know I grew up in a Christian home, obviously, and, and I know about God and I know about his love, but I had to figure out my own personal journey, my own walk with Christ. And there was a time when I tried to do everything in my own strength. I didn't want... Uh, I, I didn't want, I, I, I wanted to figure out who am I. And, and as I searched for that in that journey, it led me to a place where I am nothing without him. And, and I had to be willing to humble my heart and say, Jesus, I, I need you. And it started with me admitting, uh, without you, God, I, I have nothing. Now, it's hard to admit that anyone or anything can have control over us, because we don't, we don't like to admit that, but it's one of the very first steps, just coming to a place where we admit that maybe we have an area in our life where we've allowed pride to keep in, uh, creep in and, and, and make some effect upon our life. You know, we need to get a good look at the, because uh, when you have pride on the inside, it shows up on the outside. There's outward expressions of that pride. And we must be able to see what it is, capture it, and then surrender it to Christ. So, how do you know what's on the inside? Proverbs chapter 6, the Word of God tells us about this, and it says there's six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Do you realize that in all of those things that come against us, that or from the inside, that the common denominator woven into all of them is pride. It, it, we do these things because we want what we want, and it's that which the Lord is calling us to surrender. These are outward expressions of what people do when, when it happens. You know, pride, it just shows up, and, and we try to cover it up. We want to be able to master it, but the Lord tells us that we're to surrender it. We're to lay that down. If we don't recognize these outward expressions, we won't know how to deal with the things that are going on inside our lives. And that's when things start to get away from us. That's when we experience hurt in life. And, and we've got to learn how to navigate that and, and surrender that to God. But not only that, 
Number two, write this down. Um, Notice we only use pride when we need to cover up shame. Uh, A lot of times when we are ashamed of something that's going on, we try to cover it up. We try to use pride. This may confuse us at first, but it's true. We say things like this. uh, Maybe we're ashamed or embarrassed by the level of maturity that we're at, so we use pride to appear better than we may actually be. We, we, we try to come up with excuses for why we are, who we are, where we're at. But at the end of it all, what God is looking for is for us to humble our hearts so that he may exalt us, he may lift us up. We use pride to hide behind, but God wants to bring us to a place of understanding that we can become better if we step out from behind that pride and surrender. Now, surrendering is not always, it's easy to do, but we don't always do it, you know, um, I, I've shared with you multiple times when I got mugged at Bible college, uh, somebody pointed a gun at, or they had a gun on them and said, give me all your money. How many of you know when you see somebody with a gun, you do this? I was quick to surrender. But I had to ask myself, when God shows up and speaks to me, am I, am I as quick to surrender? Am I as quick to be willing to admit where I'm prideful in my heart and in my life? Because when God shows that to us, he's showing us because he wants us to be able to surrender that to him so that it doesn't become a wedge in our relationship. He says, bring that to me because it makes all the difference in the world. You know, there's a, you know, the question I ask is, can we ever have true humility until we deal with the things we're maybe ashamed of? And maybe it's something we're going to have to think on and ask the, the Holy Spirit to lead us. Have you ever wanted or desired to come to a specific destination inside your heart. Lord, I want to arrive at this, at this place, but, but the only thing that maybe is holding you back is, is your willingness to humble your heart and say, God, I need more of you. How many of you know that you can't get where you need to without the help of the Holy Spirit? We need Jesus in every step of the way of our life because when pride gets in there, it only brings destruction. 1 Peter 5 says, um, your younger men, likewise, be subject to the elders and, uh, and, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the what? Proud. But gives grace to the what? Humble. So he's opposed to those who are proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, in other words, this is what you need to do. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Now, we know that humility is a virtue, but what is humility? I, I, I think many times we misdefine humility. Let me tell you what humility is not. Humility is, is not being timid or insecure or feeling like you're a, a failure. Instead, humility is this, and you can write down number three. Humility is an active expression of your faith and obedience. When you feel that the Lord reveals to you an area of pride in your life, What am I supposed to do? Humble your heart. Let it be an expression of your faith and obedience and do what it is that God told you to do. That's what Moses had to do. He had to just simply obey and follow what it is that God had to say. Humility is not passive. It's active. Too many times we push things away and we think we're being humble, but humility is realizing that everything you have, all of the accomplishments, the gifts, the abilities, it's because God gave it to you. So, in the state of humility, that's where we try to discern what God has given to us and what it is he's calling us to do. Humility is not chasing for things that are beyond our reach. It's saying, Lord, what, what is it you want me to do? What step do I need to take next? It's, it's not a passiveness. It's, act, it's actively pursuing what God wants you to do. It's an act of faith. Romans 12.3 says, For through grace... Given to me, I say that everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Paul is saying, you have a measure of faith and everything God has gifted you with, now go for it and let God have the glory. That's humility. A.W. Tozer, he's a, a theologian, he said this, He said, I've met two classes of Christians, the proud who imagine they are humble and the humble who are afraid they are proud. 
There should be another class, the self-forgetful men and women who leave the whole thing in the hands of Christ and refuse to waste any time trying to make themselves good. They will reach the goal far ahead of the rest. It's about learning to humble your heart. You see, there's two extremes. There's pride, there's humility. God is calling us to come to a place where we humble our heart. And the way that we do that is through, number four, write this down, letting God's word read you. Do you read the word of God? Well, yeah, that's important. It's good to feed yourself spiritually. Are you listening, you know, getting involved, feeding yourself spiritually with either the, the, the Bible recap or any other podcast? It's good to re- listen to the audio Bible, read the physical Bible. But at the end of the day, do you let the word of God read you? Do you let the word of God reveal to you? We need to spend time in the word of God, amen? We need to be able to feed ourselves spiritually. Um, but we need to let the word of God filter through our hearts and through our lives so that it can point out, reveal to us those areas where the Holy Spirit is seeking for us to change. The Holy Spirit will show us. The Word of God will speak to us. That's why the Word of God is so important. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, it's going to be the Holy Spirit. We don't understand everything. That's why we need more of, of Him. Our hearts need to be examined. Um, I'm not a fan of going to the dentist. Never have been, probably never will be. But I have found a dentist who caters to to wimps like me, okay? Uh, When I went to the dentist, it was always because I was in pain. Uh, I wouldn't go for my checkups because I I used to, you know, when I was younger, mom and dad would take me and I'd go and they'd check my teeth. Always found cavities or something. You know, I just, I always hated going to the dentist. And so I went to the dentist because I was in pain and he said, Jimmy, he goes, why don't you come every, you know, three months and let me check you out? I said, because if I come every three months, you're going to find something wrong and you're going to do something about it that I don't like. And he says, if you would come every so many months, he said, I can address what's going on so you don't have to get to this place of pain. And I said, okay. And I trusted him with that. You see, when you go to the dentist and they take the x-rays of your teeth, what are they doing? They're looking for anything inside of the teeth that you can't visibly see that could cause problems, and then they can address them. When you go into the presence of God, you're saying, Lord, I want you to Examine my heart, O God, and see if there be any way inside of me that needs to be addressed or corrected so that it doesn't have to get to the place of needing a root canal, if you will. So that it doesn't get to the place of having to come to a point of pain or hurt or death. You see, that's why we we humble our heart and we, we seek the Lord so that he can reveal to us that what we need to see so that pride does not become destructive in our lives. We need to let the word of God read us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It simply said, if the Lord were to slice open our heart today, what what would he find? Would he find that sense of humility or would it be more of pride? Would it be more full of Jesus or more full of the world? And the desire, obviously, is that he finds more of Jesus. But we have to be willing to walk in humility, not in pride. I'll end with this. Two brothers were... um, going away to college. And upon completing college, one of the brothers became a successful lawyer and he started making lots of money. And, and the other brother, he became a farmer and he started farming the land and just continued to do that. Well, the one brother came back to visit his brother, the farmer, and he looked at him and he said, what are you doing? He said, we both went to college and we both got these degrees. And he said, look at me. He said, I've become a lawyer. And he says, I can't believe you haven't done anything but farming. The lawyer said, I've raised millions of dollars. I've had investors and you're stuck. Uh, I I wonder, he says, what's the difference between us? Without missing a beat, the farmer pointed over to the wheat field and said, look over there. There's two types of wheat over there out in that field. There's the wheat that's standing tall and straight up. In the head of that wheat, there is nothing. It is empty. 
and that's why it's standing so high. Then over there is the wheat that's bent over because the head is full of wheat. And he looked at his brother and said, some of us are standing up straight. We're walking tall. However, we are only able to do so because we're empty in the head. Some of us walk a little bent over because we're full. The test isn't what you have in your pocket. The test is what you have in your heart. And that's what it all boils down to for you and me. It always comes back to the heart. And my prayer for you and for me today is that pride would not become a place in our heart. And when it does, that we're quick to see it, we're quick to address it and surrender it in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray with me, Father. We do pray that you would be quick to show us those places in our hearts <coughs> and in our lives where we've at times become prideful. Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us for uh, just so many times thinking about how good we are when really we're only good because of your grace and what you've given. Father, I pray today that you would keep us humble in our heart so that we can see you in the midst of everything that we have and in the, in the midst of everything that we do. Lord, we want to walk in your grace and in your mercy, and we thank you for all that you give. In Jesus' name, amen.